Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, in the first half of the show, our guest is Vanessa Lantaine. Vanessa is the National Coordinator at the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, which is Canada's longest-running national women's peace organization. Vanessa has worked in a variety of roles in nonprofits around the world. In Tanzania, she worked at an organization to end child marriage and promote the rights of children. In Ghana, as a facilitator for youth livelihood skills, she facilitated training for over a thousand youth and was part of a team that rolled out the Innovation Fund for Green Entrepreneurs that was replicated in five other countries. Vanessa will be speaking at No War 2021, the annual conference of World Beyond War which is virtual this year and can be signed up for at worldbeyondwar.org. Vanessa Lantaine, welcome to Talk World Radio. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me on today. Thank you very much for coming on. So how did you come to work with Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and what are you all currently working on? Well, it's um, it was a little bit of a story. I mean, I had been working uh, in nonprofits in Tanzania and Ghana and Canada, and I was looking for new opportunities. And when I first came upon uh, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, or as we call it, VOW, uh, I tried to look on the map where it was, and it ended up being about two blocks from my house, which was very convenient for me because I, I didn't want to commute. Um, and they were looking for a national coordinator. And I hadn't heard back from them, and I was quite sad, actually. And so I emailed them again to ask them about if there were any volunteering opportunities because their message, their programs, everything about them, I wanted to be a part of. So I emailed about volunteer opportunities and that weekend I was helping to organize the Blue Scarf Peace Walk with the, uh, going, the exiting uh, national coordinator, Melissa Wheel. Um, so it's it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm so excited to be here because I feel like my entire career has been working up towards this and that I finally found uh, my true passion in disarmament. And was that the walk two years ago when World Beyond War had its conference in, uh, in the real world in Toronto? Uh, yes, it was two years ago. It was two years ago. Oh. Yeah. I, I think I may have been on a on a small part of that walk. Uh, anyway, oh, there, there was, uh, or maybe it was the end of the walk or something. A lot of people with the blue scarves came to uh, just outside the, the the College of Art and Design or whatever it's called, where we had our conference there. Um, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, oh, that's. So Thing. Well, we've got some great, great photos from that, and we're promoting the the blue scarves at worldbeyondwar.org. Um, what what else are are you working on now that you've you've been there for a little while? So so throughout um, my year and a half here at the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, we've tried to roll out some programs directly related to youth engagement. So currently, we are. Uh, endeavoring to make nuclear weapons information more accessible to youth. So we've started Project Bombs Away. We're on social media because we recognize that we want to find youth where they are, which is on their screens, <laughs> especially during this time. So we're, we're creating content and youth can sign up and help us uh, create this content. And we, they are given a, a specific topic. So they research that, we check it, then we help to create graphics and then are on a posting schedule on all of our social media channels. Um, we, we recognize too that uh, youth are not just the future, but they are today as well. So we endeavor to try to find opportunities to amplify their voices, to get them involved, because we find that once they are involved, once they have opportunities, they are so engaged and they promote the, the cause of disarmament and anti-war messaging so well because they are so technologically savvy and incredibly smart and well-read and thoughtful. So, you know, providing more opportunities for them is something that I have wanted uh, to personally improve in VOW. So uh, starting April 1st, we are actually, you guys are the first to hear it actually, we're uh, rolling out the VOW Youth Ambassadorship Program. 
um, with a series of, of tasks and hours and opportunities uh, for them to not only gain new knowledge and new skills, but to actually lead workshops uh, and improve their facilitation skills. So those are those are some things that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And because of our investment into youth, uh, we have been able to uh, be involved in so many more campaigns because youth are working so fast. They are so technologically skilled that uh, it just it really, really makes good sense to to bring them on board and to help with our cause. But on top of the <laughs> my love for youth engagement, um, we're also currently um, about to announce the Val Peace Awards. And we are also uh, debuting a, a chapter toolkit, which I know World Beyond War has a great uh, chapter toolkit and they've got chapters all over the world. Um, so we think we think that's that's a great model to to help uh, increase participation in the anti-war movement. Um, and Val also with our ECOSOC status, we for the past, I believe, 20, 25 years, we have taken a delegation of 20 women to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. This year and last year it was obviously a very different because of the pandemic. So everything uh, was virtual and last year it was quite reduced, but we are still trying to give opportunities to women and young people and people of color and different minority groups, the opportunity to get involved uh, because it's it's just so heartwarming to be in a community where you feel valued and you can talk to other people about what you care about, which can be sometimes hard to find, but increasingly with these online networks, it is getting a little bit easier. So um, we, we are very dedicated to the UN's uh, agenda for disarmament and its new women, peace and security um, agenda. So we we try to be involved as much as we can and offer opportunities for Canadian women and youth and anyone who is interested uh, to, to get more involved in that. Um, but I do want to put a little bit of a blurb in right now. Um, uh, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, along with World Beyond War, uh, new Canada coordinator, Rachel Small, who has been such a delight to work with, by the way, David. Um, uh, we are organizing events across Canada on the first day of the Global Days Against Military Spending on April 10th. And so we will have uh, fasting actions or meditations or praise for those people that uh, really love their food and don't want to fast. Um, but we are asking everyone to get involved. And on April 10th, you can RSVP at World Beyond War, uh, register for the April 10th fast, meditate or pray, and then all of that. Some people will be fasting the entire time up to Earth Day because we want to uh, solidify and, and make more concrete the link between militarism and the climate crisis. So we're, we're really looking forward to that on April 10th. And if you can join in the fast, if you can't, we ask that you meditate or pray. Um, and all of this is in solidarity with anti-militarism. It is specifically about Canada's procurement of the fighter jets. Uh, Canada is planning on buying 88 fighter jets. Their, their price tag cost is $19 billion, but through our own research and looking at comparable um, you know, maintenance prices, we're looking at more of, of about $76 billion from a report that the No Fighter Jets Coalition has authored and, and put on their nofighterjets.ca website. So we believe that $76.7 billion could be put to better use other than buying 88 fighter jets for a myriad of reasons that, that you can see on the nofighterjets.ca website. When $30 billion could end starvation on the globe, I think $76 billion could uh, do a great deal more than buy more F-35s. This is These are the F-35s you're talking about, right? Uh, and, and yeah, yeah, so it looks like Canada is leaning towards the F-35s in a way because we have already put in, I believe it's $680 million into being in the consortium that is allowed to buy the, the F-35s. So we've already uh, invested half a billion dollars 
for for jets that we may or may not buy. And you know, during this time of of economic crisis, our friends and family and businesses are struggling. Um, it's it seems <laughs> just seems so ridiculous right now to be uh, buying not only fighter jets, but Canada also has on their uh, on their military shopping list warships, um, attack helicopters, uh, drones. Um, there's just a whole a whole lineup that that Canada is asking for the Canadian public to pay for at a time when Canadians could really use that money for for almost anything else, <laughs> healthcare, yeah. education, employment, help, um, the environment, uh, you know, job retraining, all all of this. So so we believe that uh, that Canada should should really commit to the UN's agenda for disarmament and take concrete steps to diverting the military budget into programs and services that Canadians desperately re need right now. Well, the good news is these particular fighter jets may not actually work, uh, but they will work at diverting resources from where they're needed, and they will work at destroying the environment and damaging people and crashing. Uh, but uh, you're going to be speaking, as I understand it, at, at No War 2021, uh, the annual conference that World Beyond War and Allies uh, put on, which would have been in Canada, but is going to be virtual for everybody. Um, what do you... Uh, what do you expect? What are you planning uh, for that event? <clears throat> yes, I know. I I was I was quite sad last year, but you know I understood that that it was canceled. That we were, um, I really applaud uh, World Beyond War for uh, moving it to a virtual conference quite fast. So I was able to attend the sessions, and this year I'm so honored to speak. And you know this is this is one of the things that I love about about VOW and about World Beyond War and the Canadian Peace um, uh, Coalition or groups, uh, environment maybe, they, they really offer opportunities to get involved and they make it very accessible. So when, when I was approached to speak, I was really excited because we, we just feel so strongly in collaboration and working together and that we need to show how much Canadians uh, are invested in this idea of peace and peace building. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so and they and I think, to get alarms in Canada. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's. Uh, I live. I live right downtown, so there's there's quite a few that go go by, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to to show. Canada and Canadians, how much we're invested because peace uh, and peacekeeping is such a large part of our national identity. And unfortunately, since the 1990s, uh, the amount of peacekeepers that we have in the world, I think we are around number 77th in the world with about 35 peacekeepers. Um, but we have uh, 100,000 in the Department of National Defense. Um, so, you know, the, the amount of resources that we're putting towards peacekeeping and peace and especially peace research they're they canadians um unfortunately don't have um the funding that war research has so we are yeah we are we are really hoping to to flip the switch on that um for instance uh I know that some VOW uh, members and, and volunteers in McGill, um, they co-founded the Students for Peace and Disarmament at McGill. So they are currently trying to get a letter with all of the student groups uh, refusing um, war research at McGill. So, you know, things are, things are starting to happen and I think the tide is starting to change. I think we were riding on this idea that, that Canada is um, you know, dedicated and committed to peace and that they put their money where their mouth is. But, um, you know, in the, in the last couple decades, that that is not really materialized. So so I think things are changing and we're happy to, to partner with um, World Beyond War and Rachel and, you know, dozens of peace groups across the country in the Canada wide peace and justice network. That's the A. So Wonderful. that. We, yeah. We, we, yeah, yeah. We, well, sadly, we're going to have to leave it there. Vanessa Lantang, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Great to talk with you today.
On the second half of the show this week, we will be talking about militaries and universities. Our guest, Leah, is a third year bachelor's student at McGill University studying physics and political science and minoring in behavioral science. She works part-time as the executive director of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada and part-time with her student union as a political campaigns coordinator. After moving to Montreal, Leah Halla co-founded the Student for Peace and Disarmament Group, which aims to be a community for peace and justice and to end military research on campus. Leah, welcome to Talk World Radio. It's really great to be here with you, David. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for what you're doing. Sounds terrific. What is what is the situation uh, with regard to militarism at McGill? Yeah, so McGill has a long history of doing research for the military. Um, what our group fo focuses on is primarily what we call harmful militarism. Um, so less so the mil less so the research funded by the military with medical pra medical purposes or applications that, um, so to say, like have a positive impact on human health and equity and well-being, but more so a focus on the contracts funded by the military that have a negative impact on equity and sustainability. For example, um, right now there's a contract with uh, funded by the Departments of Defense Canada, as well as private military contractors, Lockheed Martin and Bombardier, that um, funds a lab that develops research to create bombs. Um, so that's a shockwave physics lab. Our groups, what we're, what we do at Students for Peace and Disarmament is not necessarily, we're not against the research. We're all for scientific research and the pursuit of knowledge. We just are trying to get our university to sell it, to sell that research to companies that use that knowledge to create technologies that better our world, not destroy it. So, so does the, well, first of all, I'm very curious, does the Canadian military and Lockheed Martin and similar companies fund medical research? Uh, that's uh... So not Lockheed Martin and not, we haven't found any labs with um, that, that have any direct, uh, direct um, financial relations with medical research, but there have in the past been, been, uh, a, there has been a, research funded at McGill's medical institutions for, um, for I believe, a treatment for blindness that disproportionately happens uh, in soldiers. So the in the past, yeah, the, the okay. National Departments of Defense has, uh, has funded medical research. However, what we primarily focus on is um, research with what, what we call harmful military research. A, coined a term coined by McGill students in in the 60s or 70s I believe that we we've, we've uh, come to use quite a bit um so right and now even if it pretty much means military research it's, it's <laughs> what you most most often think of when you think of military research so okay. it's the development of bombs but also in some it, the development of bombs the development of um computer software, oftentimes surveillance, uh, surveillance that has har harmful effects, surveillance software, as well as um, in some cases, in a, a case study in 2014, there was also psycho psychological re research that um, disproportionately impacted uh, Somalian students and was conducted on Somalian students with, at McGill University without their consent, consent. So what our group does and what past groups at McGill have done is we file access to information requests for, with with the government um, and outline requesting for the information um, of all financial documents and emails between uh, our university institution and a list of private contractors that we know to get the details because it's very, very untransparent, the, the relationships, and it's very, very hard to find these connections. Um, so yeah, at, at the end of the day, what we're advocating for is more ethical and transparent research, not for the research itself to stop for it, but for it to have an ethical application and um, for transparency in the process. Well, for that research to stop that doesn't have any ethical applications, I assume. Exactly. Do, so I, was there some sort of a, of a ban on military research at McGill that expired at some point? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so there wasn't necessarily a ban on military research, but 
in in the 1970s, I believe, there, due to the efforts of both profs and student activism, there was a clause put in in McGill's, uh, in, in, when applying for research, if you got funding from a private military contractor, you had to disclose to an ethics research board um, all of the potential negative applications of uh, of the research so you had to if if you are doing shockwave physics research and it could be used to create a certain type of bomb you had to disclose the negative impact that could have on society which <laughs> there isn't really a positive impact a bomb can have on society so so that that was a barrier that used to exist and in 2009 it was removed so the it was i was i would I personally am very would have been proud to be a part of an institution that was the forefront in taking leadership in in doing ethical research and in creating barriers to create harmful military technology um, for companies such as Lockheed Martin and Bombardier. However, we took uh, it was taken down under the like for the reasoning that no other institution had it. So right now, one of our current projects is trying to get a similar policy back in place because there's precedent for it. It has existed before. Um, yeah. So recently what we've been doing is uniting our entire student union against uh, like having making it so that our entire student union is united on the opinion um, that we are against harmful military research. So we've we've been doing lobbying work and policy writing within our student union and it is officially passed that the McGill student union is against harmful military technology, both in campus, in Canada, and internationally. Um, so we're, we've, while, while, doing, while working within our university, we're also contacting other student universities all around the country, sharing the policies we've written and the arguments we've, uh, we've used so that they can, also, they can also implement a similar policy. Um, and st every student pays a fee to be a part of their student union. And that we also, we also within McGill Student Union now have allocated resources for this work to continue um, in the long term. I, I would love to see a friendly competition among students at all the universities, not just in Canada, but around the world, including here in the United States, see who can get McGill's old policy uh, back in place first, uh, even if it's not McGill. Do, do you have, uh, I, I mean, I'd love to see student groups and World Beyond War chapters and chapters of other groups working on that. Um, do, you, do you have a website that you point uh, students to where you've got the, you know, the model text and so forth? Most definitely. Our website is still in the works, but right now it is McGillPeace.com. So, and, and then uh, our group is called Students for Peace and Disarmament, but that's that's our current website domain, so you can check us out. It's also linked to our Facebook page at Students for Peace and Disarmament. Um, but yeah, right now we're still a pretty, we, we just, uh, after after a lot of hard work from many members of our group, including Maya Garfinkel, Annika Handel, um, and from support from leaders in our student union, um, our v vice president external, we have just succeeded in getting McGill. So over the summer, we're going to be doing work so that by September, we're ready to tackle other, other help other universities in Canada um, achieve that as well and become a national movement and ideally international in the long term. Um, yeah, so Did you say you're, you're getting that policy back in place at McGill? We got it. We now our student union is in favor. So our student union, there are members of our student union who sit on the boards where policies are made. So now they are mandated to advocate for this policy over the next five years. Um, at minimum, they are mandated in every in every meeting to to advocate for this policy to be in place. Wonderful. Um, are, are professors at McGill at, at all helpful or sympathetic? Uh, do you have any impact on what's what's taught at the university? And, and what do you what do you recommend to professors and to older peace activists uh, who aren't paying attention to what young people are doing? Professors have had in the historically have had a huge impact and have, professors who have in the past used their platform make a huge app impact um on on decisions that are made uh in past years i know there there was a professor i'm forgetting his name but he worked with a group of four mcgill students to compile a report of all the research mcgill had done um over over the past like from i believe the 1930s to the 1970s that had an impact on militarism internationally it was entitled how to make a killing um and that i think i'm speculation but i think that 
report being published is one of the reasons that 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 initial policy was put into place, saying that McGill had to have uh, uh, like had to have had to disclose any harmful effects because he he made direct links between really horrible things that were happening internationally and impacts on communities and how how McGill had re had done research to make that technology possible. Um, and I think when students hear about it, like most students I've talked to, as soon as they hear about it, they care and they're, because it, it impacts us. You know, we're going to the, that university. We want research opportunities. We're there to learn and, you know, we're there to learn to create things to better our world. And none of us want to be a part of an institution or taking part in research that is funded by companies that are using our, that research to destroy the world we're living in. Like none of us want that. It impacts us. But before we stop there, like we need to know about it. And it's so difficult just to find that information. It's the process right now is so opaque um, and the information is really inaccessible. So I think, uh, yeah, step one is just is just learning about what the current situation is, which requires more transparency from our university. Yes, I'm, I'm sitting here near the University of Virginia, which gets military funding, military contracts, military partnerships, r recruits into the military. I mean, every every variety of of corruption and nobody knows. I think that's maybe what needs to be shared around the world the most is how do you do the research? How do you find out yeah. in order to get started? Right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, one one thing we're we're currently working on we're so Right now, I think I believe next week or the week after, we're hoping to go to Concordia University Student Union and do uh, run a workshop for them on how to do that research. And so we're we're providing other groups with the policies we've created and the research we've done, and then also running workshops on how to do that research so that hopefully this can spread and these efforts can be done on a wider scale. Um, and circling back to the question, I, I don't know if I fully answered it on professors' help. I think professors are the people who apply for these grants and professors at the end of the day choose well it backing up a little it it's a systemic issue that so much of the funding is like that there is so much funding from the department of defense from science as opposed to department like funding from departments of sustainability or different departments in canada and abroad it, it's a it is a deeply systemic issue however Professors can also take a major role in that transition towards finding alternative research research uh, funding sources. And so, yeah, it, professors play a really key role in this change and making this change happen. We, we've just got about a minute left. Leah Hala, how are you connecting, if at all, with the broader peace movement outside of universities? Do you think some of these active students will stay active to some degree as peace activists uh, post-graduation? The peace movement among many adult communities is so, so strong. There are so many prominent people I've I've had the opportunity to meet uh, who have decades of experience and knowledge. And I think mentorship is a key part of making sure that students who are currently engaged stay engaged with the peace movement. And I think it's super underutilized because I think it's very powerful how intergenerational this movement is. And I. I hope it would, rather than fragmentation, we connect. And I, I encourage any anybody listening who would be interested in mentorship or meeting these students to reach out to the Students for Peace and Disarmament page, um, because I think like the only way we're going to succeed in making peace a reality and ending harmful militarism is through numbers and inter intergenerational activism. Wonderful. Uh, glad to hear it. We've been speaking with Leah Halla, who is Executive Director of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada. Leah, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.